What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be, one more time, what then shall we say to all these things? If God be for us, who can be successful against us? I am here on assignment simply to encourage today. I know in conversations with quite a few of you, this has been just that kind of season. And I know I've been saying it the last couple of times I've been in here, but I talked to quite a few of y'all. And I know what you're going through. So my desire today is that you come away from this place encouraged and ready to fight on. Um, give some glory and honor to God before we move any further. God is so good, so merciful, and so kind. We bless him for being here. Also, I would like to give honor to our senior pastor, global senior pastor, Dr. Matthew Lewis Stevenson III, and his wife, Dr. Camila Stevenson. I love you both. Thank you for this opportunity and assignment. I want to give some love to my parents, Denny. Adams, Maria, Owens, thank you for your love, your care. Thank you for being there for me always. All right, y'all have a seat, y'all have a seat. I'm not a turn to your neighbor kind of guy, just indulge me for one second. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and tell them you can make it. Turn to the other one and tell them you can make it. Somebody needs to hear it. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. You, you gonna make it. We gonna make it. We are gonna make it. So as I mentioned before, my message today is, is one of work, exhortation and strategy. For those who seemingly have lived a life full of smaller battles that have sort of culminated in the war of this season. And because I've, I've, as I mentioned before, I've talked to so many of you and I know you're literally in the fight of your life right now. Who would agree? So what I know is, is in, in war preparation, oftentimes we start to put things on, articles of war to assist us in the fight. And I know that is also biblical in principle. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, if this armor assists us in standing, then why does it seem like quite a few are two seconds from falling? What are we putting on? What happens when the whole armor of God starts to be substituted? starts to become the whole armor of other things. Maybe I'll like cherry pick the armor, the helmet is nice, I'll use that. The shoes, I like the shoes, we'll, we'll use that, but we're not putting on everything. What if the, the full armor of God turns to the full armor of what my anxiety says today? What if the, the full armor of God turns into the full armor of what I'd prefer? What if the full armor of God turns into the full armor of societal norms or the full armor of this is the way I've always done it? Or my, my favorite right now, the full armor of what my favorite social media influencer has said. <laughs> I 
I, I don't have anything generally against social media, but y'all, we, we got to be careful. We got to be careful. There, there's just, there's a lot of information masking itself as advice and wisdom that I think we are putting on right now. And, and the issue is, is that you are in the fight of your life. You do not have any wiggle room right now to be putting on something that you have not vetted. <laughs> to be putting on something that you haven't tested, to be putting on something that you haven't tried, to be putting on something that worked for them, but we don't even know whether or not it works for us. Yeah. And you're in the fight of your life. You, you, you can't do that. You got to stick to what works. You got to stick to what works. What got you here? What faith got you here? What trust got you here? Y'all, look. What? I love it. What works? What works? Not what you think works. Not what I want to try this time. What works? We're, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Talking a little bit about what works, and this is not going to be a message about what to put on, because I think we've heard that message already, and I don't think that that's our problem. I don't think we have an issue in putting things on. I think we do that really well. I wanna talk a little bit today about what we need to take off. Please follow me. <laughs> what we need to take off today. You see, you, you, you can't stand because you got too many things on. It's too heavy because you got too many things on. And you don't even know if these things work, but you're just carrying them. And this is prime time. We got to know what works. Please follow me to 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 40. I'm going to read this in the New King James Version. 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 40, New King James Version. Very, very familiar passage of scripture. I've always wanted to say that. Very. <laughs> Things that make church kids happy. <laughs> 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 40. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it, and I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> I love how we love that phrase. I really do. <laughs> and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me, the Lord who delivered me, the Lord, it wasn't myself. It wasn't my own choices. It wasn't my own decisions. It was the Lord. Let's be clear. The only reason why I'm still here, the only reason why I'm still alive is not because of anything else other than the Lord. It's because of the Lord. Let's be clear. 
see, like, we'll, we'll get into this new fight. We'll get up into this new circumstance, and we'll look at the new circumstance like it's something that we haven't fought before. And technically, it's something that we haven't fought before, but it doesn't matter because the common denominator is the one that's been keeping me alive this whole time. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. 39, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, because he knows that works. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, because he knows that works. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch, which he had, because he knows that it works. And his sling was in his hand, because I love it. And he drew near the Philistine. I'm going to read verses 38 and 39 again in the New Living Translation. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these. He protested to Saul, I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. My message, you probably see it now. I can't go in these. I can't go in these. Let's do some work. <laughs> <laughs> I love y'all, I really do. Our author today is likely the prophet Samuel. He, he's our writer today. His death isn't reported until the first verse of 1 Samuel 25. Samuel was Israel's last judge and the one who anointed Israel's first two kings. We get to this king-led monarchy in Israel because the nation asked for a king to lead them so they could be like all of the other nations, according to 1 Samuel 8 and 20. Our text is important today, 1 Samuel 17, uh, because in my opinion, it's, it's one of the most popular in all scripture as far as story goes. People that know nothing about the Bible, have no biblical appetite whatsoever, are familiar with the basic principles of this story. Giant boy. Giant fights boy. Boy, above all odds, beats giant, kills him, cuts his head off the end. But as we journey through this text, I'd like to encourage you not to become too familiar with anything in this Bible. Because there's always additional revelation for those committed to the seek. Jesus says, Luke 10, 21, O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever. And for revealing them to the childlike, yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. So let's, let's posture ourselves in front of this text like we don't have backstory of it. Forget about everything that you learned and Sunshine Band and everything that you've talked about throughout your lives. We're going to approach it 
a different way and see what the Lord has for us. Our main characters, as we start off in our analysis of this text, obviously is David and Saul. And this conversation that they're having, this is the first time that we'll see in history where two kings, current, Saul, future, David, are having a conversation. We're actually privy to this. This is really, really a, a historic thing that we're seeing. And uh, shortly after David was anointed to succeed Saul as king, excuse me, go back a little bit, a little bit more context. Saul was anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And David was anointed to succeed him as king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. But David didn't speak in 1 Samuel chapter 16 when he and Saul initially met. Point here. One thing I know about anointed people is that you will eventually come into a season where your assignment and your posture, whether you want to or not, will be moved from accessory to main character. And I know everybody loves promotion when it has something to do with you making some more money. But nobody wants the promotion when it forces you right in front of the giant that don't nobody else want to fight. <laughs> but I promise you this oil is an investment. So if he's invested the oil in you, there is going to come a time I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, you, you can't just, you can't stand in the back anymore. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, what do you want me to say? You can't, you, you can't, you can't just, you know, what if David just said, hey, look, I know you anointed me, I know you invested this oil, Samuel, but I just, I just want to take care of my father's sheep. Or, you know, I just, I just want to play the harp because that's all I really want to do. No disrespect to Glenn and Shawan. You know, we love y'all musicians. But what happens when God is calling you into another realm of influence? That's what happens with the oil. So now we see. And, and so, like, why, why, was, why was David anointed? David was anointed because Saul, in, at this time, actually, it, it happened one chapter before, 1 Samuel chapter 15, where Saul is being rejected by God and succeeded by David as king because his disobedience to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord commanded him to utterly destroy Amalek. And to completely destroy everything that they have, according to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul, in disobedience, only destroyed everything that was undesirable and worthless. But kept everything that was good, including sparing the life of King Agag. Point two. There will come a time, King queen, servant, whoever, where God is going to test your definition of the word everything. Because we got some people that like love the semantics and you're just going to tip around like you don't know what everything means. And when God says I want everything. He wants everything. Everything meaning everything. So then we look at David. David, on the other hand, arrives at this conversation with Saul in our text because he was obedient to his father. 
his father tells him, 1 Samuel 17, 17 through 18, you know, take this basket of food, roasted grain, loaves of bread, some cheese, to his brothers and their captain and bring back a report. Point here for those of you that are frustrated because you have to fight a giant just because you are being obedient. Because your expectation is that because I was obedient, I'm going to be able to kick back, kick my feet up, and just enjoy. <laughs> So in summary, one could say that Saul's disobedience and David's obedience were the vehicles that got each king, current and future, to this battlefield with this giant. What are you saying, Pastor Matthew? I'm saying that you're probably going to have to fight a giant regardless. Once again, I'm sorry. I don't know what you want me to say. But what state will you be in when you get there? Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. What posture are you in when you're disobedient? And you know good and well you're disobedient because you know good and well what everything means. <laughs> David, on the other hand, in full obedience, probably caught a little bit off guard because I'm just doing what my father told me to do and now I have to fight this giant that nobody wants to fight. With this in mind, what state will you be in when you get there? Let's read this conversation again. 1 Samuel 17, 33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came back, took the lamb out of the flock, I went after it, struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like them. So from my vantage point, this illustration shows that our future king, because of his obedience, is speaking from a place of complete faith. While our current king, Saul, because of his disobedience, is speaking from a place of crippling fear. What are you saying, Pastor Matthew? I am saying the courage necessary to fight giants grows in concert with the courage necessary to live a life of obedience. They grow together. They grow together. How do I know that Saul was scared? Well, reasonable deduction. 1 Samuel 17, 16 says that Goliath strutted in front of the Israelite army for 40 days, day and night. Quick calculation is 80 times. Now, I, I got to chill on Saul just a little bit because he wasn't a punk. Saul was also a man of war. But let me tell you something. 80 times? You would have thought you got all of these certified killers, Saul, the army, everybody, and you would just think that somebody would say, look, by time number 40, by, by time number 50, time number 75, I am tired of this dude. If I die, I die, tell my story, but I'm tired of this. So not only was Saul afraid, but the rest of the army was too because you can't lead in disobedience and expect the repercussions of fear and timidity to not infect those following you. The, the people that you're, you're leading, I, 
consider your courage necessary. Give me some scripture. Yes, I will. Joshua 1, 16, 18, New Living Translation says, they answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us and we will go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we obey Moses and may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. So be strong. And courageous. These are the people that Joshua is leading now, telling him, well, look, we really need you to be strong and courageous. We'll fight you. We'll do everything. But don't be a punk. That affects me. That affects my house. That affects my wife and my kids. If you're my leader and you're a punk, got to be strong and courageous. So, so if you're struggling in courage, I'd ask you to consider whether or not the foundation of your yes is sure. Help me, Lord. It's not about you. It's not about your shortcomings. It's not about your, your lack of preparation or your anxieties. Just find yourself in obedience. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses is having this conversation with God. And mind you, at this time, Moses is probably 70-something, mid to late 70s. And he tells God... Well, I have a speech impediment, so how could you send me and I stutter? I'm like, bro, you've been talking this whole time. You ain't said nothing about a stutter. <laughs> because sometimes what you think is your anxiety is just the gravity of the season that you're in. We, we, we probably got to look at it a different way. Message point, well, I forgot whatever message point I'm at, but just roll with me. Now we get to the primary point of our message where we're firmly established. We understand Saul is clearly not going to fight Goliath. David clearly is. And this is where my full interest peaks. Rather then Saul and David's conversation ending right there, it continues. Saul has some suggestions on what David should wear, which also could be seen as Saul offering suggestions on what David should do. You know, you can't scare, you, you can't tell me that scary people don't give advice. Because cause my brother, you had more than enough time to get this together. More than enough time to get this rectified. Sometimes these people will want no parts of the battle that God has called you to, but they'll know exactly how you should do it. Now, if it was me, you know, I'd do it this way. Or if it was me, you know what I'm saying, I would have said this. We all see that that's not true. You wouldn't have done it. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs> Let's read this part again. Verse 38 says, then Saul gave David his own armor a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. So David put on Saul's armor. Now, real quick, mind you. When Saul was anointed, this is 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul stands up. And the Bible says that he was a full head above everybody else. I don't know how tall Saul was, but he was very tall compared to the other men. David is a child. 
David, is, David, at most at this moment, is 16. He's probably closer to 12. Why are you giving him your armor? What, what about this is going to work for him? It just, it, it doesn't even make sense. And what's interesting is that David, being a child, was mature enough to understand that it takes a certain level in God to know what you do need. It takes a totally different level in God to understand what you don't need. And David, being fully aware of the situation, knew that what Saul was trying to give to him was not something that was necessary for his success. He didn't have it with the bear. He didn't have it with the lion, but he had the Lord. So as long as the Lord was there, he didn't need that. And you know what? Right now, we, we, we have to be so careful. We got to watch our eye gates. We got to watch our ear gates because there's just a surplus of untested, unsubmitted, unregulated advice that's readily accessible wherever and whenever you need it. Directions, instructions, and self-help. And if we aren't careful, we'll adopt it and we'll put it on right before the fight of our lives. And here's the real problem with that. What's the real problem is this. What happens when we get in the habit of seeking help from sources who run away from what we're running towards? What happens when you have a proclivity? Because, I mean, we won't spend that much time in our Bible, but we'll spend that much time scrolling, trying to find the answer that's in the Bible if we would just look for it there. Y'all, we, we have to be careful. You're in the fight of your life. Things are hanging in the balance, and we are listening to people that are running from what we're running towards. I think it's, it's really important, as I mentioned before with David, that we just mature a little bit. We have to understand what is important and what is going to work, not in general, because I don't have an in general kind of fight. What is going to work specifically for me? What do I need in this moment? What is going to work for me in this moment? I promise you, you get down and pray. My Bible tells me if I acknowledge God in all of my ways, he maybe will direct my path. He possibly will direct my path. If I catch him while he's awake, he'll direct my path. I love the word shell. Tell guys all this all the time. I love that word. Because an overthinker, historically like me, I'm getting so much better, needs absolutes. I need something that I know is going to work. And that shell just does it for me. We have to find the shell. We have to seek and find the shell and stop worrying about armor that may or may not work from people who may or may not even know our names. And, and I'm, I'm not going crazy and getting off on those people with platforms. That's what the platform is for. I'm talking to you because I love you and I want you to be careful about what you're receiving. What you're employing. What you're going after and what you're using in the fight of your life. Imagine if David had that people-pleasing thing that so many of us do. 
And instead of taking off the armor because he knew it probably wasn't going to work for him because Saul was the king. And Saul, look, we don't have any context at this point that David had ever killed a man. The Bible doesn't say that he does. Bears and lions, yes. But it doesn't say that David had ever killed a man. So it technically wouldn't been a... a, a a totally bad thing if he would have listened to him. He had some years on him and he had some experience on him, but we have, we have to test what we're receiving. There's a scripture, where is it? I think I put it in here. First Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21. And the Amplified says, do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do not scorn or reject gifts of prophecy or prophecies, which means spoken revelations, words of instruction, or exhortation, or warning. Verse 21, but test. But test all things carefully so you can recognize what is good. So for those that are keep, those of us that keep employing things that are bad, maybe it's because we didn't test it. I cannot go in these. I have to stay connected to what works because my life is at stake. This message may resonate with some of you. I'm glad y'all got y'all shouting out because this wasn't a shouter, and I don't really do shouters like that, so I'm glad y'all shout during praise and worship and get it all out the way. (laughs) This message may resonate with some of you because you may be weighted down with the viewpoints of others, what you should be doing, where you should be living, where you should be working, how behind in your life schedule you are. (laughs) And you may be even going through the fight of your life right now feeling unprepared, feeling unarmed, feeling alone. But your perspective of your previous fights matter here. Because if David, going into this clash with Goliath, only sees the fight with the lion and the bear as divine reprimand, then he wouldn't have had the faith in God necessary to advance against Goliath. Think about those smaller battles, not as divine reprimand, but as divine preparation. David was successful because he had time with God and he valued that time in those smaller battles. So please, please, please do not consider this time in your life a personal attack. I know it may feel like that. But what if it's just target practice? What if it's just conditioning? What what if it's just target practice? And the same God that was with you then during practice will be with you now. The same, it's the same God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I had all of them. You think I stopped with them? I got you too. I'm the same God. But we, we have to be intentional, y'all. I'm, I'm wrapping up. We have to be intentional about what we put on. We have to be intentional, even about what we listen to, who we listen to. I, I know a lot of you are carrying ways that you shouldn't have even been carrying because you shouldn't have even heard it. 
Do you have my phone? Let me see it real quick. I need to, I need to, I need to look up a scripture real quick. This is one of my favorites. Um, let me get it in the Amplified. This is 1 Samuel 15, 24. It says, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the command of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. This is Saul of his own admission communicating why he got rejected. And many of us don't understand why people pleasing is such a terrible thing. You the king, you supposed to be fighting why you know so much about what they saying in the first place. If I got to please the people, I got to know what they say. And that's how we get caught. I can't go in these. Everybody's standing. Now is not the time for your faith to fail. It's just, it's not the time. It, it's, it's no wonder why Sunday, at the last couple of Sundays, Pastor Tashire preached a, a wonderful word last week on faith. Yeah, give it to her. And, and this is not the time. There is too many people depending on your consistency. There is too many people depending on you listening to the right things and going forward from there. There are too many people. And you know what? The main person is you. The main one is you. You need it for you. You need it for you. So what are you asking me to do, Pastor Matthew? I am asking you to lean into God in a way that you never have before and ask him for the answer. What, what if God is just waiting patiently for you? I was, I was telling the, um, the guys in our, our morning edification last week, uh, Apostle, at the beginning of this year, deemed 2024 the year of JBAS, the JBAS year. And so I've been working with the guys kind of periodically with this thing I kind of call the JBAS journal. And every entry, I would just ask God for really outlandish things on their behalf. If this is the j year and we're not asking, what are we doing? I had a vision, maybe it was is not too far after that. And God was sitting at like a, like a workshop desk or like a woodworking desk. His sleeves were rolled up and he was just shaking his head. And he was like, they not asking. They not asking. They're just not asking. And I, I know that many of you have experienced disappointment, many of you have experienced, you know, what you believe to be unanswered prayers, and you just don't have the faith right now to ask again. But I'm, I am asking you, I'm, I'm begging you, ask again. 
Ask, ask again. At, ask again. Ask again. Ask again. Ask again. Matthew 7 and 7 says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. That's KJV. Amplified says, keep on asking. The keep on is where you'll unlock the mysteries of God that you have historically felt like you're locked out of. I'm not asking you to ask one time. I'm asking you to continue to ask, to continue to seek, to continue to knock. If anyone here today is, is experiencing a season right now where you just don't have it, you feel lost, you're not sure of your, your left from your right, you're up from down, and you just need somebody to meet with you and pray with you. You've been looking for answers everywhere. You've been scouring the internet, listening to all your favorite albums, and you're just not finding the direction that you're looking for. Can you come down? We'll, we'll pray. We'll pray with you. Yes, Lord. Do not have to find yourself in another season where you just don't know what to do. You're really familiar with that, but I want you to ask today. And I'm not asking you to, to go and ask and stop at the place that you stopped at last time. I'm asking you to push past that place. I'm asking you to push past that line. I promise you there's some answers for you in this season. And there's some answers for you right now. Lord, I thank you for your word that has come to convict the hearts and the minds. Lord, I thank you for just being who you are, I thank you for being a faithful God, a consistent God, a God that always sees, always knows. You are El Roy, so you always see, and you always know. Lord, I ask now. You said if I ask in your will, so I am asking now. Meet your people here today now in the name of Jesus. Give them the direction and the understanding of where to go, who to be with, what not to use. Lord, I am asking now in the name of Jesus to meet your people and comfort them in a way that reminds them of who you are. Do this now, I pray in Jesus' name. Speak life, you're gonna live, oh my brother, my sister. I speak life, you are the head and not the tail, you will prevail. I speak life, don't give up the fight for your life. You shall live and not die.